How are you? Good morning. Okay. Good morning. I'm I'm a little I'm a little raspy today. Not me, but the microphone is. So welcome. Glad to have you all here today, and uh, welcome on this beautiful Mother's Day that we're celebrating today. This is a, a day for us when we honor mothers in in all kinds of ways. And so some of you are grandmothers and mothers. Some of you are great grand. How many of you are great grandmothers here? Oh, we got a whole bunch. Are there any great great grandmothers here? All right, we didn't quite, well, we'll ask that question next year in case somebody, somebody, somebody crossed the threshold on that. But, but today we're honoring mothers in all the forms that mothers come. Those of you who are biological mothers, some of you have been spiritual mothers in the church or in your life of faith to people helping to nurture and grow their faith. Some of you are mothers with kids nearby or some of you have, are mothers with kids that are far, far away. Um, some of you have kids that maybe you're a bit estranged from. That's never an easy thing when that happens. Some of us always wanted to have kids and that never quite quite came to pass. But on this day especially, we want to honor our own mothers and remember our own mothers. I like to say that the real Mother's Day was the day you were born because that made your mom a mother when you were born. That's, that's what changed everything. So that's the real Mother's Day. But today we honor all kinds of moms. And also we got a birthday today. Jesse Thompson turned 39 today, I understand. Is that right? You're the youngest guy here practically. <laughs> shall, we sing to, shall, we sing to, shall we sing to Jesse, Pat? Is he, is he 90? No, we're just going to honor him. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Jesse, happy birthday to you. 
I, I'm honoring him because he does all kinds of things around here. So he's a treasure for the Methodist men, does lots of other work as well too. So um, as we are getting ready to celebrate on this Mother's Day, we need to pick some hymns. Do you have some hymns for us to start with? Phyllis, you're ready to go. Three, four, seven, spirit song, okay. What else? Blue app, yes. 2032, my life is in you, Lord. Okay, great. 328, all right. And which one is that, John? Surely the presence of the Lord. Okay, great. Landon? 2223, they'll know we are Christians. All right, that's good. All right, and then looking for a Denny. 431. 431, a favorite. Our constant prayer, let there be peace, 431. All right, very good. And um, let me share a, a few announcements. We, uh, Pastor Ross is away with doing some, having some family time today. We thought that was a good thing on Mother's Day for him to be able to do that. And we're starting or continuing this sermon series, this worship series on the parables of Jesus. Each week we'll be looking at a different parable. And today we have one about a widow who was a remarkable woman, persistent in uh, what she was trying to do. And she's a great example for Mother's Day for us. Also coming up, we have some activities for people who are new to us. And if you are new or feel new here, we'll be having our Lakeview preview, we call it, next Sunday at uh, 1040. And it's a gathering to meet the pastors, find out a little bit about the church. On the 16th, Monday the 16th of May, we'll have our uh, new member orientation. So if you're interested in joining the church or finding out what's involved in that, come let the office know and then come join us on the 16th for that too. Do we have any folks who are here for the very first time? If you would just raise your hand if you're here for the first time. And I think, Nancy, you already got called out. So <laughs> let's see. I wanna, we have a gift for you. And uh, Ross usually does this. I'm learning, always learning the routine around here. So we, we have a special pen that apparently lights up and does all kinds of neat, 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 neat things. So in, 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 enjoy that, certainly. And where are you from, Nancy? Delaware. Oh, you, you came a long way. All right. Well, welcome, welcome from Delaware. In the back, from Florida. We got people coming a long way for church today. Welcome. We'll get you, be sure we get you a pen also. Jan's got the prayer list back there. We want to be sure to invite you to fill out the prayer requests before the service. We find sometimes it's especially hard to hear prayer requests from these two sides of the chapel, just the way the sound works in here. So if you can fill that out, that will be helpful to us. And now we have a special video for Mother's Day that we would like to show. And Glade put this together. So let's, let's watch. Life. Every life. Every heartbeat. Began with a mom. Who willingly accepted a divine role. A thankless job. A sticky, sleepless, soul-stretching career. For nine months, 90 months, 90 years. She taught us right from wrong, left from right, baking soda from baking powder. She slept little and worried much. She laughed lathered, rinsed, and repeated, and repeated. Who taught us to love God, to love others, to love ourselves? Who prayed with us and prayed for us? Who read to us and taught us what the words meant? It was Mom. Who was the champion, the cheerleader, the chief inspiring officer? Who was the queen of bedtime, dinner time, holidays, holy days, early mornings, late nights, music lessons, life lessons, and everything we cling to with all our hearts? It was, it is, and forever will be, Mom.
a gift for us today. Thank you, Glade. Beautifully done, beautifully put together. I want to add my welcome to those who are participating with us online. We're glad you're here to share in our worship with us here today. We try to start our announcements a few minutes early because we know some of the things don't always apply for our online folks. So we want to welcome them when we're ready to start. Let's do some singing together. We got hymns ready to go? All right, the thumbs up. Let's start with Spirit Song. Enfold you with his spirit and his love. Let him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let him have the things that hold you and his spirit like a dove. Will descend upon your life and make you home. isn't it? Beautiful, beautiful words. My life is in you, Lord. You remember that one? My life is in you, Lord, my strength. All right. The book helps. We got to work on that together. You clap on two and four, the second beat and the fourth beat. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. It's another, it's another prayer for us as we begin our worship today.
picks. Uh, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Do we have the words for that or should we use the book, Glade? We got them. Okay. <laughs> we are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love. Yes, they know we are Christians by our love. And then our, our last prayer this morning in our singing time is let there be peace on earth. And we thank Pat for playing flute for us today. Beautiful, beautiful to have the flute with us. Thank you. some prayer concerns that have been written down and for that I thank you that's very gracious and considerate of you to do that the rest of you I'm just going to let it go <laughs> we're praying for Jerry LaFontaine right Cindy breathing problems and in the hospital Judy Bell who's having back surgery today Tuesday, sorry. Well, it kind of looks like today. <laughs> we will pass that on. Thank you. Um, and Jack Bell, who will be alone and, um, and worried about Judy, of course. Also, Dennis Keeney, I just learned, is in the hospital with pneumonia. I have one for you too, Dave. We surprise each other. The other one is Ferris McCullough, who's been in and out of the hospital today. They're doing an emergency bronchoscopy to scrape his lungs, see if they can improve his breathing. He's lost a tremendous amount of weight and been hospitalized over and over again, and they're not sure what's wrong. Just ask your prayers for not only for Ferris, but for Clara, who's very concerned in their family, and be with them in this time of some real apprehension and surround them with God's love. We also pray for Randy Chambers and just ask that uh, you remember Maxine and also Sue Darlington, who I believe may be released by now, but we're not sure, so we'll find out today. There are others in this um, handout today, the rehab facility and those who've been released. Please be in prayer for them as well. And 
We would take prayer requests. I may or may not hear them. Yes? For who? Thank you. That is such an obvious thing. Thank you. I didn't get down that far, I guess. Uh, Pat generally attends this service, and her husband died suddenly of a heart attack the other day, on uh, Wednesday, as a matter of fact, and so what a shock. Also, we have word of uh, Lavana Barnhart, and who died on April 29th. Thank you for that, Jan. Other prayers? Bless you. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer of our own. O oh, great and loving God, our Father, we find you in our fathers, our mothers, our sisters, our brothers, and we feel blessed. We come together today called to pray as children of your creation and kingdom. It's a calling deep within us. It reflects our need for nurture, comfort, and assurance. We remember Jesus calling you Abba, Daddy. It's as though we, called, we crawled onto your lap and, and said, Oh, Daddy. Many of us have had that sense of peace in our mother's loving embrace and in our father's strength, protection, and encouragement. We hunger at every age and stage of life for a renewed sense of those experiences and open our hearts and minds to your presence. In Christ, the living word who lives and reigns to guide us, we have an example of praying without ceasing. May we focus without distraction on the needs of your people each day. Today we are focused on these persons for whom we have prayer requests. For Jerry LaFontaine and Judy Bell and Jack, for Dennis Keeney, for Ferris and Clara McCullough and for Pat Juniper and others we carry in our hearts. Those prayers are vital and important. Let us share them one with another and know that we are part of the concern that you have as well each and every day. We thank you, Lord, for what you do. We thank you for your love and care. Give us the patience to endure and strengthen us to, to withstand every trial of life and guide us not only to pray for these persons whom we have named, but to reach out in phone calls and visits and loving care as often as we can to those around us to give them the strength and endurance that they may need in their times of difficulty. In Jesus' name, we remember the prayer he taught his first disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the need forever. Our scripture lesson for today is Luke 18, 1 through 8. The New Revised Standard Version is the parable as Pastor Dave said, of the widow and the, well, he didn't mention the unjust judge. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my accuser. For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. 
And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, it's so good to be back with you. I've been away for a couple of weeks, and uh, it's a blessing to be back here to share and worship together. I I certainly want to express on behalf of Kim and myself our, our great thanks for all of your prayers and the wonderful cards and notes and uh, all of your love and caring you shared with us um, after the death of my mother and while we were out there in Northern California having her memorial service. We began and ended her memorial service with a song we sang together today. Surely the presence of the Lord is in that place, is in this place. So now, I'll always think of that song now in a very special way because it was a part of the part of that service. But but thank you for the ways you have cared for us and helped us to, to come through this time that has had its own challenges for us. Makes it a more tender Mother's Day for us when we've lost a mother. And many many of you know, many of you know that as well. well. Today, as we honor the gift of mothers, we we want to reflect a bit about how it is that mothers shape our lives through the gift of love, the gift of faith that they offer to us, and the ways in which that has an influence on on our very being, who we are, and and who we are as God's people of faith, as as Christians. And I always appreciate how mothers can be so savvy about kids and about raising kids. There was a a young mother who went out on a Saturday morning to get a little time for herself and and left her husband at home in charge with with their their, uh, preschool. They had a little girl who was about three years old. And the husband was just really engrossed in reading his newspaper. He had his tablet open. He was scrolling through the paper. And their little girl had a favorite toy she was playing with. It was a, a little a little plastic tea party set. You've seen those, or maybe you had one of those that had a little plastic teapot and then some saucers and cups. And so she she poured a little bit into the uh, into the cup and brought it out to her dad and offered him some tea. There's a little bit of water in the cup, and he th- he thanked her and said, "Oh, thank you for the yummy tea." And went back to reading his newspaper. And she, she did this a couple more times. And then mom came home and the husband said, sit down here, sweetheart. This is the cutest thing in the world. You got to see this. And pretty soon the daughter came out again and brought, her, brought the saucer of the cup and, and, and gave it to the dad. And he sipped it and he said, thank you again for the delicious tea. And the mom said, as only a mom could, mom could realize and say, she said, do you realize, dear, that the only place she can reach for water is the toilet bowl? <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank God for mother's wisdom that just <laughs> sees things as they are. Maybe not the sweetest Mother's Day story I could start the sermon with. <laughs> but we're, we're doing this series on, on parables that Jesus told. And, and you all remember some of the parables. This, this was a unique way that Jesus taught using these very memorable and meaningful stories that, that have a way of sticking with us and that have a layers of meaning to them for us to unpack and, and to understand. And in the parable we read today, Jesus talks about the experience of prayer and the time when we are tempted to give up, when we're not sure we can keep going in prayer any longer. The heroine of this story is a widow, which makes her a, a good subject for, for Mother's Day. So we want to talk about her a little bit. And And I would say that that prayer is probably one of our most common spiritual practices and in some ways one of the least understood. I I think a prayer in some ways for us is like like using the internet. All all of us want to be able to connect with God like we try to connect on the internet. But we don't understand how the internet works. Most of us don't, do we, if we were honest about things. And uh, we don't always understand exactly how it is that prayer works. And, and most of us pray, I'm, I'm sure, probably almost all of us in this room pray, but, but there are times when we can't help but wonder, is anything really going on? Is anything really working in this prayer? Sometimes we might feel that we're just one prayer away from giving up. And, and so Jesus gives us these parables as a way to help move us, to move our insight, to move our faith further and closer into the kingdom of God. So our understanding 
is greater. And in this parable, I love the story about this widow who is so determined. She, she pounds and pounds on the door of this corrupt or, or unjust judge. And the word apparently can also be translated as, as politician. And apparently he has no concern whatsoever for her and for her needs and for her cause. And uh, we don't know if he was a man who just um, had no conscience whatsoever, if he was just in it for himself. Certainly makes us think that nothing's changed in politics over, over, over the many, many years since that parable was first told. But the widow here is someone who is seen as powerless. She, she doesn't have a husband, so she's not as powerful as she used to be in her first century world. She doesn't have an inheritance. The inheritance would go to the kids. She doesn't have any real standing in the community. She is a woman without much power at all. And, and maybe you have had moments when you felt for yourself that you have also been in a powerless position, unable to make the things happen that you desperately want to make happen. Jesus wants us to be able to move like this widow, to move from a place of resignation to a place of resolve, from a place of helplessness to a place of hopefulness. That's where Jesus wants us to live. And, and we would call this a parable of contrast between two people and, and two qualities here. It's really a parable not so much about our persistence in faith, about trying to persevere more in faith, it's really a parable about that unshakable and enduring love of God that is available to every one of us. And how it is that we can tap into it. And how it is that we can trust that God hears us, hears our cries. It's not a parable really so much about how we grit our spiritual teeth and try to hang on a little longer or to see if we can just push through this problem we're facing or, or not feel guilty if we've given up too soon. This is a parable about reminding us that God never forgets us and never forgets what it is that we need. Regular, repeated prayers have this way of moving us from helplessness over to hopefulness. I like the way that Maggie Dawn said this. She has written much about the spiritual life. She said, constant prayer shapes the person who prays. I really like that statement. Constant prayer shapes the person who prays. Repeated, habitual prayer gradually tests and shifts what you believe is really important or what becomes apparent as something of ephemeral value that doesn't matter much. If something doesn't matter much, she said, the momentum for prayer will begin to diminish. But if it does, if it does matter, an unanswered prayer will become like grit in an oyster. Remember Pastor Linda talked about the oyster last week. If something does matter, an unanswered prayer becomes for us like grit in an oyster. It worries and annoys us until we are determined not to take no for an answer. And I think there's some wisdom in that statement. Um, one biblical scholar also pointed out there's an alternative translation to one of the verses here in this passage too. The place, the verse in verse 5, where the corrupt judge says he's going to go ahead and grant what the widow is asking for because he's getting tired and worn down by her. The alternative translation says he's going to grant what she wants so that she may not finally come and slap me in the face. <laughs> so this is a word about a strong and assertive way of praying for us. I liked how Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish theologian, would write about prayer. He said, prayer is not always about changing God, but changing us. Let's hear that again. Prayer is not always about changing God, but about changing us. The ways that we see the problem we're praying for. The ways that we see perhaps the solutions that could be helpful for us. The ways we see where there might be help available to come to us. The ways that we can see or make decisions not to give up on this problem. So let's be people who can hear what God is giving to us, even when the answers seem to be slow how God may be giving us an answer, helping us to sift 
what we want to do with this problem or to change how we see things or to inspire us to act. If you have been someone who's been pounding on the door like this widow here, and she is a woman who will not give up easily. If you've been pounding on the door, maybe you need a new approach or a new practice for prayer. How many people here have ever gone to physical therapy? I bet there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole lot of us here. So, so what do they do to you when you go to physical therapy? First of all, they give you pain, right? They, they, always, they always make you hurt someplace where they're working on you. But, but what they also try to do in physical therapy is to retrain you, to retrain the way that you move or the way, or the way you walk, maybe the way that you move your arms or your hands, the ways that you use your muscles. And, and there is some fascinating research that's been coming out in the last few years about the brain and what they call the neuroplasticity of the brain. It's about how the brain can adapt and change when it receives new input. And this is a great help to us in certain times in our life. One of the things they found from this research is that daily meditation increases the density of the gray matter in the brain. Daily meditation, daily prayer, increases the density of the gray matter, which is responsible for our ability to focus, for our memory, and also for our compassion. This is an astounding thing. Prayer will make you smarter. Some of you here need that, I think. (laughs) I need it. (laughs) It's encouraging me to pray more when I read that. Routine prayer can yield some surprising insights for us, that we will receive more readily or perhaps more quickly through regular routine prayer. Perhaps that's a way that God is speaking to us. And if you've been knocking and pounding away and feeling like you're not getting an answer, maybe one thing you might try is coming to Pastor Linda's prayer class that she's offering now on Mondays at 10 a.m., I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Here, right here in this room, in the chapel. It's called Before Amen. And in that class, you might learn some things about some new practices or approaches to prayer that, that might be a way to help you move from that sense of helplessness to hopefulness or when you're feeling stuck in prayer. I, I like the way that Pastor Mark Batterson put it when he was writing about prayer. He pointed out that when things aren't moving for us in prayer, then maybe it's time that we learn to move a bit ourselves. He used the analogy of that wonderful story about when Joshua parted the Jordan River and then allowed the Israelites to cross over into the Promised Land, a story from the Hebrew Scriptures we call call the Old Testament. And, And Pastor Mark said it this way, never see God part the Jordan River in their lives because their feet are too firmly planted on dry ground. We're saying, God, why don't you go ahead and move this water for us? And God says, why don't you go ahead and get your feet wet first? You know, we, we're waiting for God to move, and God may say, I need you to take a step of faith first and foremost in this. And when we move, then we might see God begin to work on some movement. And we know that God can move all kinds of things. God can move heaven and earth for us. This, in a sense, is really about what we might call the flip side of prayer. You may have heard this before. We say that we pray as if everything depended on God, but we work and act as if it all depended on us. Jesus certainly knew that it was a challenge for us to keep praying, especially when things looked impossible or seemed so difficult, or in those times when we have been praying over and over again, day after day, week after week, month after month. I, I, I know in our family, we've had to work on learning some things about this as we have prayed for my wife's Kim, my wife Kim's chronic pain and for some help and progress for that. And we've been praying for over 20 years for help for her with that. Right now, I know that there are millions, literally millions of people around this planet who are praying mightily for peace to come in Ukraine, for an end to this terrible war and the awful violence that is going on. And and we are pounding on heaven's door just like this widow was doing in the story here. 
Sometimes we can feel like we've gotten ourselves into a rut in our prayers and, and we're not sure what we should do differently. Sometimes when we have to keep praying, we, we feel like, well, maybe our prayer, prayer should just be that we don't lose heart, that we don't give up and can keep trusting that God is working has not forgotten us. Sometimes in these hard and long periods, we just need to pray that God will help us learn how to live through this time. And God can answer that prayer as well. Houston Smith, who was a scholar of world religions, made this interesting statement. Let's put this quote up on the screen here. He said, the role of religion is to enter the ego not to pander to its desires. Let me say that again. The role of religion is to decenter the ego and not to pander to its desires. That says to me that we always want prayer to be a way that we can step towards God's desires and to step away from, from just our own. We might pray that the Holy Spirit leads us in that direction through encouragement and by giving us the courage and the hopefulness to keep going, just, just like this widow was able to do. So I was working on this message this week. I was remembering a woman in the very first church I served as a pastor. Uh, she was a mother and, and a grandmother and a very active member in the church. And, and I was a brand new pastor. I was a student pastor, actually. I was still in seminary. And I'm going to tell you, I was very green as a, as a pastor. I had a lot to learn. And, and this grandmother in the church, she had a son who, who was also a part of the church. He, he sang in the choir. He had a beautiful voice. And he was also an alcoholic. And, and while I was there as a student pastor, his alcoholism began to get, get worse and worse. We had a death in the church uh, one time. And uh, the family, as we were planning and preparing for the funeral, they, they requested that this man sing a solo. And I, I really wasn't sure what to do. I said, okay, we'll, we'll see if he's available. We can make arrangements. Well, on the day of the funeral, he showed up to sing the solo, but he had been drinking heavily. I didn't know what to do. So I, I let him sing, and he, he kind of, kind of mumbled, mumbled through the whole thing. Looking back now, I wish I had said that he needed to go home or found a ride for him. To, to go home. That would have been a better, better solution to have offered. A couple of weeks after that funeral, this man woke up on the floor one morning in his kitchen in a, in a pool of blood. He wasn't sure what had happened and how he'd gotten there. But the next day, he started going to Alcoholics Anonymous and started to work on his recovery. I was talking with his mother about that a bit later, and she said to me, I have prayed for him to get sober for 25 years. Here was someone who had prayed for over two decades, not giving up, wanting to see her son be able to achieve his sobriety. She reminded me of this widow who wouldn't stop, who wouldn't give up, knocking and pounding on the door because in her case, she had such a deep love for her troubled son and believed that God would not give up on him and she shouldn't either. Some of you, I'm sure, have been in similar situations where you've had a difficulty, a place, a problem, a place of heartache where you have had to pray and when you started, you had no idea that you would be praying for such a lengthy time for the help that you needed and the results you wanted. These are what we might call door-knocking prayers, door-opening pray prayers. We pray for God to be able to open the doorway of someone's heart or the doorway of a problem. And God is working knocking on our hearts and the hearts of others to open the door so that God can enter with courage and hope and the help that we need. Let's practice now knocking on heaven's door as we pray together for all that we need from God this morning. Would you pray with me? Oh God, each of us brings much. Whenever we come to church, we may be carrying the weight and the worries of the world with us, maybe a problem for just ourselves, maybe something so private we could scarcely imagine mentioning it out loud. 
But you, O oh God, know what it is that's within us. And you know our need for help. And so we turn to you. Teach us not to give up. Remind us of the ways that you work and how you continue to strengthen us by even the very act of prayer alone. Your help is coming to us. And we are grateful for your love that holds us and will not let us go. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. We're preparing now for communion, celebrating a memory that the disciples had and kept, a way of being in constant prayer, a way of remembering what God has done for us, reminding us that communion means coming into union, joining together. That there's something wonderful about the prayers we offer. They're not just for ourselves, but for others. And reminding us of reaching out and helping those people and bringing them together. Jesus gives us this wonderful way of coming together with him and with each other. On the night in which he last ate with his disciples, he picked up a loaf of bread at the table. He broke the loaf and said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. And at the end of the meal, he took the cup and blessed it as he had the bread and lifted it up and said, this cup contains the blood, my blood of my body, a new covenant for forgiveness for you and for many. Drink of this always in remembrance of me. And so as we take bread today and we drink from our cup, we remember and we are joined together with God, with Jesus, with the world. Let us press these elements. Oh, loving God, Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice from the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes and we feast with him at his heavenly banquet. With your Son, Jesus Christ, in your Holy Church, with your Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty God, Father of us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The bread that we share this morning as we share in communion is a reminder for us of the life of Jesus and of his body. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us, it is also for us a sign of how we are one in Christ Jesus. He will say, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all take part, partake in the one loaf. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven itself given for you. Let us eat in faith. As we consider the juice from the vine was wine in Christ's day, we think about the gift that has been given to us, the opportunity to know that we can go to God in prayer over and over again. And if we continue in prayer ongoing each and every day throughout the day, it brings us closer to what God's will for us would be in that day, in that moment, and in our lives. And reminds us that when we step apart from that, distracted by human nature, the cup is there for us, a cup of forgiveness. Let us share. As we conclude our worship today in this time of communion, let us pray together in the words of our prayer for our church. We'll put this up on the screen, and I invite you to pray with me. Loving God, we pray for our church in this important time to do your will and to be a faithful witness in our troubled world. We pray for each other and all that we need from you. 
We pray that you would strengthen our ministries and the ways we may be for our community a living reminder of Jesus Christ. Lord, stir in us a desire to serve you, to care for others, to relieve suffering, to be your light in any place of darkness. We pray for our financial needs and our ministries, that we would be able to do all that you ask of us. Mold us, fill us, and use us, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As so we finish up our worship, I share a reminder again to be sure and fill out the, uh, the attendance slip we gave you when you came in. You can place that in the offering plate up here. We invite giving to the church every week because it is your gifts that help make our ministry possible. For those who are participating online, we invite you to give as well. There are many ways that you can give electronically or by mailing a gift to the church. Every gift counts no matter the size. It all helps our ministries. And our media arts team is starting up movies again uh, this afternoon. So if you'd like to come back at one o'clock to join them, I think The Chosen, is that right, Glades? The Passion of the Christ. I knew it was about Jesus. I knew that much, at least. <laughs> so The Passion of the Christ will be showing this afternoon. Yes. There's coffee and snacks. Fellowship Hall. All right. You don't have to leave right away. There's goodies for you. Thank you, Blue Ed, making that possible. In, in the Fellowship Hall? Yeah, in Fellowship Hall. All right. Smoot Hall. All right. Keep walking. Keep walking. Yes, Yvonne. It's a great story. I don't have time. We'll save it for another one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's hear this word of benediction. As we go forth, may the loving Christ go with you, walking before you to prepare your way, beside you as your friend, above you to protect you, beneath you to hold you up on God's grace and strength. Go in God's peace. Amen.